We've been using this acronym, which is a response to the various errors that came into the church. And so the first one, total depravity, speaks to the, to the situation that man is totally unable to bring himself to God because of his sin. His, uh, human sin has left us dead in our sins and in our trespasses. It has caused us to be spiritually dead and we are therefore unable to bring ourselves to God. We must then be made alive in Christ and with Christ. We must be transformed by regeneration that we would even behold and see the goodness of the gospel. All of humanity is plunged into sin due to the sin of Adam and we have all sinned and fallen short. The you that we looked at, unconditional election, is that although all of humanity is plunged into sin as a fallen race in Adam, God has chosen to show mercy on many people to redeem for himself a people out of this fallen race. He has a grand plan to save many who do actually deserve hell, but he has promised to show mercy. Uh, the L that we went on to, limited atonement, is that the atonement definitely saves those who are elected of God that God has chosen to save. He does not merely see how they go. He does not merely offer salvation to them and hope that his uh, the atoning work of Jesus could possibly save what someone, but he definitely saves his people. So it is limited in who it is intended to save, but it is never limited in its power. Uh, we went to irresistible grace, which is that scripture says that God wills and works in us just as he pleases, not according to our will, but to his will. It isn't that God drags us to himself and we hate that, it means that he operates on our heart. He does a gracious act of giving us a circumcised heart. He restores us to a place where we actually want nothing else but Jesus Christ himself. His grace, therefore, is irresistible. Uh, it does exactly what it sets out to do, which is to save us. One of the things that we've seen throughout this series is that this is a Trinitarian work. As we think about God saving us, this is, in fact, the work of the Trinity, the father elects, he gives the elect to the son, the son pays uh, and atones for the sins of his people at the cross, and the Holy Spirit applies the work to the individual and to the sinner. Now, some people at that time say these are some deeper things to go into, thinking about what God has done before the foundation of the world. Why is this important? This is supremely important for a number of reasons, because it teaches us what the Bible actually teaches. As Christians, we are required to study all of God's word. It is his revelation to us so that we know him, know what he is like. God didn't give us the scriptures for us to go, I don't like those particular parts, I'll skip over them and find other parts that I prefer. We are required to study all of scripture. And these teachings are found clearly in the pages of scripture. But it's more than just being obedient to studying all of scripture. When you get the doctrines of grace in your heart and you understand them, they give to you a high view of God, not a low view of God. Many today have God as a helper in the sense that I'm to be awesome in this life and God's just going to cheer me on. They say things like God knows my worth and he's there helping me to be this person who's kind of front and center in life. But that's not how the Bible describes it. God describes that God is front and center, that he is the most important being and his glory is the most important thing. And so when we study and understand the implications of sin and God's electing, saving work, it shows us a high view of God rather than a low view of God. Are you somebody who has previously had a man-centered view of God where opening the Bible for you was all about just opening to try and find something for yourself? Now, you will see yourself in Scripture as we read and apply it, but the first thing to do when you come to the Scriptures is to learn about God. Do you open the Bible for you firstly, or do you open the Bible for God? If you open the Bible for you time and time again, you have a man-centered view of God. And so, by these teachings, we're having a high view of God who is sovereign and in control of all of his creation. So, these doctrines bring the most glory to God. Because we're saying that he saves us by grace alone, by his work alone. We're emphasizing the fact that we have contributed nothing and therefore God is the one who has mercifully given us salvation. And when God is glorified, human beings are satisfied. You could say we are happy children of God 
when we are seeing God glorified in our lives. And finally, the thing that you will get particularly hope uh, from today as we study the scriptures here is that with the, these doctrines expounded, you actually do have assurance of your salvation. It isn't just simply that you hope to be in heaven one day, but when you read what the Bible actually says about your salvation and your eternity with God, you will have assurance if you apply these doctrines to your thinking. If you are somebody who has struggled with, am I really saved or could God really persevere and continue with me with all of this sin that I keep wrestling with, then this sermon is for you. If you are somebody who, who questions this and wants to know, will I really be in heaven with God? Will I be with him for all of eternity? This sermon is, is for you, to grow you in assurance of your salvation. So we are talking about the perseverance of the saints today. Let me expound, um, uh, give a bit more of a definition of this today. Those whom God has foreknown, and I'm, I'm, we're going to look at Romans 8 in a minute, but this is where this is coming from. Those whom God has foreknown, predestined and elected since before the foundation of the earth are those whom he also calls to himself through the gospel. So those whom he's known, he has put out the call, the gospel call by human means, sent that gospel message out, you heard it, you received it by the inward call to come and be regenerated by the Holy Spirit. He has given his people a new heart and he justifies you, meaning that he declares you righteous now in his sight. Having declared you righteous in his sight, he now goes on to sanctify you, which means to continue to um, remove the sin and make you more like Christ throughout the course of your life. Set apart, sanctified by God for becoming like Jesus. That's what God has done. He and what he is doing. Declaring us righteous in his sight, sanctifying his people. Now, we should ask the question, does he then do all of this work to leave it up to you? Did he know you from before the foundation? Did he predestine and call you to himself to then say, and now it's on you to see if you get over the line? No. He sees us through until we are glorified. <coughs> A true believer perseveres until the end, therefore, by the grace of God at work in our lives, for the glory of God alone. Will you turn with me, please, to Romans 8, verses 28 through 30. Romans 8, 28 through 30. This has been a key text for us that we've been working through. Coming back to it each week, and we're going to expand a little bit on this one this morning. Romans 8, 28 through 30 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So already in the text, there's a couple of things to take notice of here. All things are working together for good for this particular people called according to his purpose. We should emphasize that right there. His purpose. That's what we've been talking about and God being glorified that this is all about his will and his purpose. And so when things are working out in your life for good, it's because God has determined this to happen for his purposes. In verse 29, it says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So verse 29 gives us foreknowledge, that God has a foreknowledge of his people. Not that he foresees a people, but he, fore, he knows them beforehand. He has a closeness, a love, and an intimacy with these people right from the beginning. And he predestines them for sanctification. That's what this phrase here is, conformed to the image of his son. So before the foundation of the world, he had you in mind. He knew you and loved you and was planning to make you like Christ. Such a very long time ago. And now, verse 30, those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So are you seeing in your Bible, and hopefully you've got your Bible in front of you to be able to follow along and not just take my word for it, but see God's word being presented to you today. What you were seeing in God speaking, he says, his work that he begins, he predestines, that he conforms you to the image of his son, this is his work in all of this that he is doing. While we are, uh, uh, while we are understanding this justification, 
Remember what God does in justification is that he justifies the ungodly. So just take a, a moment as we, as we stop in this and remember what justification is. God justifies the ungodly. So have you ever felt ungodly? Have you ever known yourself to be ungodly? Have you been able to recognize, hey, I am a sinner. Well, here's, a great, here's the great news of justification of what God does in you. He justifies the ungodly. So if, you're, if that's you today and you're still unsure of salvation in Christ, well, there's good news already for you here because that's what God does. He justifies those who are ungodly. Jesus didn't come for those who are well and righteous. He came for those who understand and know, yes, I am a sinner who needs salvation. So God is in the business of justifying the ungodly. Those whom he justifies, guess what? He sanctifies, that is coming to the image of, uh, uh, being conformed to the image of Christ. So does he do all of this to abandon you? No, he doesn't. He takes you all the way through that you will persevere in your faith until you are glorified. That's the beautiful doctrine of glorification. And because you now have union with Christ and you cannot be separated from him, there is a day coming where you are glorified with Christ. That is your final stage of redemption that is promised to believers. Now, let me ask you this morning, do you have days of being fatigued about sin and struggle? Do you have days where in your physical body there is, there is just pain and discomfort? There is a day promised to you where that is no more. There is a day coming where you have a glorified body just like Christ has. You are glorified with him. This is the final stage of redemption and it is promised to believers. Do you believe the promise today? If you believe that Jesus died on the cross, that he was raised and that he ascended, then believe also the future promise that he is giving you a glorified body and he is going to see you through until completion. What I want to do to, to help you have this assurance this morning is we've been in this Romans 8 section, right? Looking up to these verses and going over them. So hopefully they're well embedded with you. But let's have a look at what Paul does just after this. He doesn't stop there just to say, here's the golden chain, the beautiful start to finish um, process of sanctification. Let's read on a little bit here in the text. Romans 8.31 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And look at verse 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Is that good news to you this morning? How powerful to, you to receive this. That not only has he demonstrated in this chapter that there's this golden chain that he starts this work in you, but he's going to finish it. And now he has this expanded section of saying there is, there is none who can remove you, none who can shake you, none who can separate you from the love that Christ has for you. Praise God. But did you catch this wording here? Jesus is interceding for you. If you want to talk about somebody who's helping you in your journey of following Christ, maybe you've got somebody who you would say, in me following Christ, I can give praise to this particular person because they've been praying for me, they've been teaching me things, they've been helping me to continue to follow Christ. And I'm just so grateful. Maybe you say that about somebody. You think about somebody in your life like that. Jesus is the very person who is doing this for you. Almighty God, the second person of the Trinity, he is praying for you and interceding for you from the right hand of the Father right now. That you will persevere in faith right through to the end. So it's one thing to have a 
have a great friend and we praise God for, for, for brothers and sisters in faith who are praying for us. But we've also got Jesus interceding and praying for us through to eternity. How can we be separated from his love when Jesus is praying for you? How can you be separated from the love of God and torn apart from him when he who has all of the power and all of the authority in this entire universe praying and interceding for you? I hope someone receives that with joy this morning. Jesus is praying and declaring that you will not be lost. Turn with me, please, to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. These are some of the texts to just help you to understand this teaching and have assurance in your salvation that you will persevere to the end. If you are truly in Christ, he loses none. John 6, verse 39. It says here, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is beautiful. What we have here is, the teaching that we've looked at previously, which is that the Father gives the names of the elect to the Son. He says, all that the Father gives to me, I will not cast away. So that's the Father giving the elect to the Son. And now Jesus speaks of the elect here and he says, this is the will of him who sent me. This is the will of my Father, that I should lose nothing of all he has given me. So none of those names of God's people that have been given from Father to Son will be lost but here is the finishing work. I will raise them up on the last day. Verse 40, he says the same thing again. For this is the will of my father, that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Praise God. We have Jesus saying it. We've had Paul saying it to the church in Rome. What about what he says to the church in Philippi? Come now to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. This is taking place right at the beginning of the letter. Opening statement that Paul gives to the church in Philippi. And from verse 3 of chapter 1, he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Take a look at verse 6. And I am sure of this, Paul writes, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. So this phrase alone demonstrates God's initiation in the relationship. Now, sure, you had a time, of course, where you were... In your human self, as we're talking about uh, in, in human terms, you were asking questions and you were wrestling with the concept of God and maybe you were thinking through heaven and hell or what your parents taught you when you were younger and all this sort of stuff and you made a decision one day to, to believe in Jesus and follow him. Yes, absolutely. Why? Because God initiated uh, uh, salvation with you from the very beginning. That God, behind the scenes in his sovereignty, was at work drawing you to himself to bring you life, to bring you to life. And so he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I want to ask you this morning, do you believe these words or do you read them and doubt God? Do you read them and then still think maybe he won't fulfill those promises for you? The teaching here in the, in the scriptures, and I hope that you're seeing it, is very, very clear but I will say this, there are many who do struggle to believe these promises. And they have another idea about Christians being able to lose their salvation. Now, let me just separate a couple concepts for you today. You'll have heard me say that we must make sure that we understand the Bible speaks of God's sovereignty, meaning that he is in control. He alone works. At the same time, while the Bible speaks about his sovereignty, it also speaks about human responsibility. That's all the stuff that you and I are told that we must do, like put sin to death, like be prayerful people, uh, share the word of the Lord with others around and uh, do the things that he has actually told us to do. Neither of those are in conflict. See, human responsibility fits into God's sovereign plan. 
What he has decreed is that we would be praying people. He has decreed from the beginning that we would be evangelizing, gospelizing people. He is at work in human means to bring about your sanctification and your salvation. So none of these things are ever a problem when we say there are things that you must do. Absolutely. That's part of God's sovereignty. It's part of his sovereign purpose and plan. But be careful today that you're not trying to run over to the human responsibility conversation when we're over here having a God is sovereign conversation. We're emphasizing today the scriptures that speak about God's sovereignty over all of this. Yet some people will be so focused on humanity and self and, and human means that they continuously pull away from the God is sovereign conversation and want to emphasize man. And I want to drag you back over and say, no, we're having a God is sovereign conversation today. He saves people by the effectual call of the gospel that is delivered to sinners by the general call that goes out from the mouth of Christians. But he is at work in and through that sovereignly to bring about his people to salvation. But all of those things, as I said, aren't the verses that we're looking at. We're looking at the sovereignty of God and salvation. But hang on a minute. Somebody says, I knew a person once. I knew somebody who they even acted like a Christian and said that they were a Christian. Uh, we have to ask the question here when we, when, we, when, we, when we hear this. If somebody tells you a Christian, are you required to take them at their word and believe them? When they tell you that, you, that they are a Christian, but everything that they do is opposite to what a Christian does, are you still going to believe that they're a Christian? I think about, say, well, let's use Donald Trump, for example. Donald Trump says that he is a Christian, but Donald Trump also says that he's never had to repent because he's never done anything wrong. What are you going to do with that? Are you going to believe Donald Trump that he's a Christian, or will you judge and examine by the fruit and the works that this isn't true salvation? And this is exactly what the problem is. When people say uh, this silly phrase like once saved, always saved, I mean, that's, that's ultimately what we're saying is salvation occurs and you, and you land on it. But when people say the phrase once saved, always saved, what they're implying is that you can say a sinner's prayer at one point in your life and then you can do whatever you like and you'll always be saved. That's not what the teaching of Scripture says. We shouldn't be so gullible to, 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 to believe that and think that that's actually what we're saying. Look at what the texts are actually speaking to us today about, that God will cause us to persevere until the end. So you have a decision to make when people tell you that they're a Christian. We are to examine the works and see that they truly love Christ, that they truly do hate their sin. Yeah, they're sinners, they're wrestling with it, but they love Christ and are, are laboring in such a direction that they are growing in him. Let me give you a text to back this up as well. Turn with me, please, to 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. Not John's gospel, but the, the shorter letters of John. Towards the end of your Bible. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. Teaches us this. They went out from us. So it's referring to a group of people that were once with us. And they went out from us. Now that's not talking about people who have decided that there's a church that better suits them, right? talking about people who said that they were Christian, but then they went out from us in the sense that they are saying that they're something else now, right? They're not living for Christ and got any desire to do so. They went out from us, but they were not of us. What that means is they were never of us to begin with. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. So there are people who will profess faith to you. And then at some time later in life, you will see them fall away. Um, is this helpful to be able to understand that you've, you've probably seen this in your life? And I'm not suggesting that you then turn around and go, you know, call them a, a, a faith convert or anything like this. There might be times for doing that and loving people to, to challenge them on the scriptures because we would always hope that a person actually you know has maybe they're just in a time of falling away there um, they've been deceived by something there's a, a moment or a time of backsliding and they will return 
But if they turn out to truly not be a Christian, they were never one in the beginning. That's what we're saying here. They went out from us because they were not of us. They were not a Christian in the first place. They're not a true believer. I don't think that it's ever up to us to write somebody off because God rescues hypocritical types like myself, like you. People who, though, have said one thing and done the opposite. We should be wary of such a one and preach the gospel consistently to all people. To see someone go out should also be the intent that salvation would occur for them and that we would see them truly come in and come to saving faith. And that may very well be some of our stories here. Well, at one point in your life, you said, I thought I was a Christian, but then you're able to, to say, but then I heard the gospel and my eyes were open. Something changed. I was able to see the glorious good news. And so you understand that you too were in a situation where you thought perhaps you were a Christian, but you weren't at that time. But by God's grace and mercy, he called you to himself and he regenerated you. He gave you new life. So here we are in our conversation of God's persevering with us until the end. Come back with me now to John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. John 10, 28 and 29. It's our verse that we started with this morning. John 10, 28 and 29 says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. So that's you, Christian, who have been given eternal life. You will never perish. And then Jesus goes on in this section to say, no one will snatch them out of my hand. Verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. So I give them eternal life. They will never perish. It doesn't say I will give them eternal life and hopefully they will never perish. It doesn't say, I give them eternal life and hopefully if they are good enough to, to manage to, to press on. No, it says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Jesus wants to emphasize this never perishing aspect of his teaching. To say that you are assured in your salvation. He doesn't leave it there, but he goes on now to give this illustration of you, of me, not being able to be snatched out of his hand. This is the almighty grip of the all-powerful Christ. King of the universe. No one will snatch them out of my hand, he says. Jesus has all authority. He reigns. And not even Satan can take you out of his grip. He has a hold of your salvation and your life. He says, this one belongs to me. This one is mine and you cannot take them from me. He says you will not perish. His grip is too strong. But look at what he does here. He doesn't just leave it. He started off with saying, you will never perish. Then he says, None can be snatched out of my hand. But now he gets his father involved. He brings the father in on this as well and says, none can snatch you out of the father's hand. This is father and son. We're, we're heading towards a Trinitarian grip that he has upon you now. This is the work also then of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to turn here, but let me read this to you. Ephesians 1 verse 13 says this, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him was sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. To be sealed is to be marked by God, his divine possession. He has bought you with the blood of his son and you are his. This seal is a seal of redemption. He claims his own. The seal is an assurance that you are a child of God and that this seal has not been broken. So I, like I said, this, this grip has become the father the Son, and the Holy Spirit's work. This is a Trinitarian grip that he has upon your life. This grip is so powerful. This, this grip is so tightly around you, yet at the same time, how patient and loving is the Lord. How firm is his, is his grip upon us, yet at the same time, he is so patient in helping us to persevere unto the end. I hope today that you're hearing afresh what God is like for you. Are you hearing his powerful and securing work of salvation as he calls you to himself to hear these things. And again today, make sure if you are somebody who is here today and you are not yet a Christian, 
but you are hearing this general call that I'm, I'm speaking about of having a right relationship with God and you would be one who has ears to hear and say, I want Christ. I want to have this redemption. I want to have this forgiveness of my sins. I, I know about my sins and I feel guilty and I feel, I feel sick sometimes when I close my eyes and I think about my sins. I want to be able to lay that to rest and not have this shame anymore. Then call upon the name of the Lord and he will save you, friend. Believe in the salvation that comes through Christ. Jesus died upon the cross. He was raised to life for you. Believe and be saved. And the beautiful response is just to tell, tell God, repent of this sin. Lord, I am sorry for my sin and I, I believe that Jesus died and was raised again. Speak to him even in this moment, in the quiet, just as you would speak to him from your heart and speak to him today and be saved, be justified by the Lord God. Christian, I pray that you would receive this good news coming to you today as well of the assurance of your salvation. Today, are you somebody who is tired and weary? Have you tried and labored in ministry or in anything for the Lord? And you could say, I've, I've labored and it has been so hard. Friend, I would just speak to you from the text today to say, don't grow weary in doing good. Jesus promises that we will reap a harvest. And he who began a good work in you will complete it on the day of Jesus Christ. That's the promise to you today. Don't grow weary. Come to him and rest today as you need to. But don't grow weary. There is a promise of security that is here for you today, Christian. What about the person who is here today who is so tired of their sin? And I'd say that's probably most of us, right? That's the majority of Bible-believing Christians who are aware that they have a sin problem. And you have these times and these days where maybe you're doubting yourself. You know, maybe you're doubting the fact that God has called you. Maybe you're thinking, am I really saved? Could I really be thinking those same thoughts again if Jesus has purchased me with his blood? Am I really talking to my loved ones like that again, even after he has purchased me and foreknown me as the promise is, is declaring to me? And maybe as a result, you've had moments of doubting your salvation. You, let me just speak to this a little bit further. You, you doubt probably because you spend more time looking at yourself. See, the promise is he's going to complete this work in you, but a lot of the times we're doubting and struggling because we're spending so much time navel-gazing and looking at ourselves, Always looking to, the, to ourselves continues to give us opportunities for doubt. If you are so focused on always looking at yourself, what do you see? You see brokenness and you see sin. You're supposed to be looking at Christ. You're supposed to be looking at the cross more than you look at your own sin. You're supposed to be more looking at the blood shed for your sins than dwelling in the brokenness and muck of our own lives. Maybe you're, maybe you're tired and, and feeling idle, and, and again, because your gaze is upon your work ethic and your availability and all the things that you're doing, but you're supposed to be having your eyes set upon the goal and the promise of Christ Jesus our Lord. We are running this race towards him. And if you are looking long distance to Christ and understanding that he is sanctifying you, he is changing you. Yes, you hate your sin, you're supposed to, but look to Christ and look to the cross today. Hear these words of scriptures. The scriptures proclaim to you of the assurance of your salvation. We need to examine our sin, yes. I'm not saying don't examine your sin, but look to Jesus and his finishing work. Strive toward the goal that is Christ Jesus himself. Look again to the cross today. Call upon the name of the Lord yet again today. More than anybody else's words. And just take a practical look at your, at your week. Did you spend most of your week uh, uh, thinking of the words of Christ about your life and your salvation and your sanctification? Was that what was saturating your thoughts and your thinking this week? Or was most of your time looking at man's words and man's writings? See what I'm saying? If you are indulging and having a, a saturation of your mind in man's words, you're going to be fearful. You're going to be distracted. You're going to doubt yourself. You're going to be tempted by images that you see on the internet and be led away into those places. But you are to be mature in Christ and grow in feast upon his word. You are one who is supposed to be applying the words of God to your thinking. 
to fill your mind with the life-giving words of God rather than the lifeless words of man. So, if that rings a bell for you, if that, if that speaks to you today, look to Christ and to his word this morning, this evening. But not just again next week when I, you know, when the preacher brings it out for you again next, next Sunday. Saturate yourself with the life-giving words of scripture this week. We've gone through the doctrines of grace, studying these. It's not enough to just have a theology textbook and become Calvinist and go, okay, I, I can articulate these clearly. You've got to see these in the text. To have a transformed heart, you have to have these doctrines preached to you from the Bible. You have to read them and saturate and soak them up from the scriptures. So this week, come to God through his word. He is the author and the perfecter of your faith, friend. He is faithful all the way through. You and I aren't. We are the faithless ones in the relationship. He is the faithful one. Be set upon him this week. When we say Calvinism, we say the doctrines of grace. These titles are simply to help us articulate the beautiful truth of Scripture. The teaching that salvation is all of God from beginning to end. It's his grace to the sinner. He is your redeemer and he has made you alive with Christ. Let me finish with this Charles, quote, uh, Charles Spurgeon quote this morning, which says, There is no such thing as preaching Christ and him crucified unless we preach what nowadays is called Calvinism. It's a nickname to call it Calvinism. Calvinism is the gospel and nothing else. I do not believe we can preach the gospel if we do not preach justification by faith without works, nor unless we preach the sovereignty of God in his giving of grace, nor unless we exalt the electing, unchangeable, eternal, immutable, which means unchanging, conquering love of Jehovah. Nor can I comprehend a gospel which lets saints fall away after they are called and suffers the children of God to be burned in the fires of damnation after having once believed in Jesus. Such a gospel I despise, says Charles Spurgeon. And so may we too only use these terms and may they have helped us to be people who articulate the scriptures well, to help us to emphasize God's glory, his saving grace to us that we did not contribute at all, but that he alone gets all the glory. May we be strengthened as a result. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you this morning as we have taken this journey on this, this deeper study of salvation, the, the doctrines of grace, and we recognize, Lord, that we are those who are unable to bring ourselves to you. And so we thank you and praise you that you have, bring, you have brought life to us, you have regenerated us, you have made us alive with Christ. We thank you that you have called us out of darkness and brought us into your family and that Christ is praying for us that we will persevere until the end. May you receive all the glory and may we grow as obedient followers of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.